welcome to Solothurn. Unfortunately, you cannot be here with us, but I really hope that uh, we can have uh, also a Q&A as if you were here in live. Well, thank you and hello Solothurn. <laughs> I wish I could be there with you. <laughs> Next time, maybe. <laughs> Well, let's jump right into it. Um, in your film, The Act of Killing, that we just saw, actually the project you started working with victims of the genocide. So how come that your interest for the film shifted from the victims to the killers? Well, when the army found out that we were interested in what happened in 1965, the Indonesian army is stationed in every village in Indonesia. We were on a small plantation village about 60 miles from the city of Medan, where we went on to make the act of killing. When the army found out that we were interested in the genocide, the army would no longer let the survivors participate in the film. So the survivors said, Josh, before you give up, before you quit, try and see if you can film the aging death squad leaders in this village and find out what happened to our relatives. They might speak. Now, I approached these men unsure if it was safe to ask about the killings, and to my horror, I found that every single one of them was immediately boastful, gris recounting grisly details of the mass killings in front of their wives, their children, their grandchildren, often with smiles on their faces. And in this contrast, between survivors who were forced into silence and perpetrators who were boastfully divulging things far more incriminating than the survivors could ever have told me. I felt as though I'd wandered into Germany 40 years after the Holocaust only to find the Nazis still in power. And I knew at that point I would give as many years of my life as it would take to address not so much what happened in 1965, but the present day impunity built upon what happened, the regime of corruption, fear, thuggery. When I showed this early footage back to those, those survivors who wanted to see it, not everybody did, but most did, and to the human rights community in Indonesia, everyone said, you're onto something so important to keep filming the perpetrators, mm -hmm. because with this material, you can expose the whole nature of this regime. Any Indonesian who sees this will be forced to acknowledge what's wrong here, mm -hmm. the rotten heart of this regime. Keep filming the perpetrators. I then felt entrusted by the survivors and the human rights community to do a work of historical and moral and political importance that they could not do themselves. And I spent two years filming every perpetrator I could find. All of them were boastful. All of them were, would immediately invite me to the places where they killed, or almost all of them, launch into spontaneous demonstrations of how they killed. Anwar was the 41st perpetrator that I filmed. <laughs> but the first day I met him was the day he takes me to the roof, shows how he killed with wire, danced the cha-cha-cha. That was at the end of a two-year process of filming every perpetrator I could find. And in uh, the very final, five years later, I, I lingered on Anwar because somehow his pain was close to the surface and I started to intuit that maybe the boasting I've spent two years documenting isn't really just a sign of pride. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's a sign that these men know what they've done is wrong but have never been forced to admit it and therefore still have open to themselves the possibility of justifying what they've done. Maybe this is a defensive way of insisting to the rest of the society that what they did was glorious so that they don't have to, mm. uh, because the alternative is too horrible for them to contemplate. Mm. Um, I spent five years filming with Anna, exploring that and mm. the consequences of denial on this whole society. Mm. The final scene in the film where Anwar returns to that roof is the very last time I filmed him, five years and 1,200 hours of footage later. Mm. But so actually this, the, the, the way they bo they're boasting and they like to pride themselves with what happened, is this what logically led to use the method of, of, of reenactment that you use, which of course uh, made us see, see things that we've never seen in, in, in documentary. So, was it, why, why did you choose this reenactment even to go further and to let them play um, and even play their own victims? Well, in the first instance, I'd say yes, the method was a response to their boasting and openness. It was a way of trying to understand why are they so boastful? For whom are they boasting? 
You see, I felt I was getting something much closer to performance than to testimony. Because no normally when we hear from perpetrators in the documentary, they've already been forcibly removed from power, forced to admit what they did was wrong. So naturally they deny what they've done or they apologize for it. These men have never been forced to admit that what they've done is wrong. So they're boasting. And to try and understand why, how do they want to be seen? How do they see themselves? I allowed them, I told them, look, you participated in one of the biggest killings in human history. I want to know what it means to you and to your society. You want to show me what you've done. So show me what you've done in whatever way you need to But I will also film you and your fellow death squad discussing what you want to show and what you want to leave out and your reasons for leaving things out and your reasons for showing things. And in that way, answer what I felt were the questions that would allow me to expose a whole regime. Mm -hmm. How do you want to be seen and how do you see yourself? Mm -hmm. Now, I did not anticipate this kind of, that this would lead to these elaborate genre-inspired dramatizations. That came somewhat more, or somewhat organically, when I started to screen the footage back to Anwar. Mm -hmm. Because Anwar's pain seemed close to the surface. I did something with him that I had scarcely done with anyone else, which was to show him back the footage of himself on the roof at the beginning, the first day I met him, to see if he would recognize the meaning of what he's done, the moral meaning mm -hmm. of what he's done, in the mirror of the footage. Because, of course, he's telling what he did, but he's not, ta but he's not telling, he's denying the meaning of what he did. Mm -hmm. And when he watches that footage, I think he looks very disturbed. I think mm -hmm. he sees what he did is wrong, but he doesn't dare admit it, because to say this makes me this is terrible, or even to say this makes me look bad, would be to admit what he did was wrong, and he's never been forced to do that. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a film about impunity, about what happens when killers win and are not forced to reconcile, recon, reconcile themselves mm -hmm. with the meaning of their actions. And so Anwar denies what the meaning, lies to me and to himself about what he's seeing and says, it looks, uh, it's wrong, it says, it should, it's, it, he says it needs to be improved. He clearly looks upset by what he's seeing, but he lies about why he's upset mm -hmm. and says that he should uh, improve what he's done with better costumes, by dyeing his hair, with better acting. And so began a five-year process of mm -hmm. Anwar embellishing, or quote-unquote, improving what he's done, mm -hmm. always, in fact, trying to run away from the true horror of what he's done. Mm -hmm. In that sense, what's fueling so much of his process, I think, is his conscience, his need to run away from his guilt and deal with it at the same time. And so maybe in hindsight, it's not so surprising that these ever more elaborate fictional dramatizations become the cinematic prism through which he finally glimpses the real meaning of yeah. what he's done. It, it's really true. It, like what impresses me a lot about the film is also how you take us on a, on a trip, also on a cinematic trip of a collective imaginary of of especially, I think, gangsters, or that's what stays with me, is like in fiction or even in gangster rap or whatever, we, we like gangsters or, and, and like those stories, but then in documentary it gets much more disturbing. And uh, does this, this blurring also of, of expectations, like uh, in, in film genres also, is this in a way a relation for you also to blur the, the meaning of, of good and evil or... Or well, I, yeah, I, I first uh, I, I would I would put my foot down right there and say there's no blurring of the meaning of good and evil in the act of killing in one sense, and that there's not a single second in the film where we forget our condemnation of everything that Anwar and his friends do. Mm -hmm. The thing that's confusing there is we refuse to make the leap from saying these men have done something monstrous to these men are monsters yeah. because we know that they're not; they're human. In this impulse to make the leap from saying these men are mon have done something monstrous to these men are monsters, which is categorically not true, they're human. Um, in that impulse, though, I think we seek primarily to reassure ourselves that we're not like them. Mm -hmm. And while we might hope that if we grew up in Anwar's family in the 1950s Indonesia, that come 1960 would make different decisions. We know that we are extremely fortunate never to have to find out. And so I think there's, that's fundamentally, the film is, and the film witnesses, I think, somehow this, down, this downward spiral into a moral vacuum that comes because we as human beings, Anwar as human, and, and 
all of his fellow perpetrators as human beings know what they've done is wrong and are desperately trying to convince themselves otherwise and therefore maintaining, clinging to a moral lie. Mm -hmm. And it's a film about the effects of that lie. Mm -hmm. Your question about fiction is interesting. You know, I think one of the things, there is a profound kind of vertigo for some viewers that it comes at different points in the film, perhaps when they rebuild the film set and burn down this this village. Of course, mm -hmm. it's not a real village mm -hmm. and there's no victims there. It's all this immediate relative family members of the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, even the woman who looks like she's fainted is the wife of the man on television. Oh, really? <laughs> says God hates communists, the military leader. Mm -hmm. um, we, yeah, it was very important to me there should be no victims and no survivors on set. And the presence of Anwar's neighbor was actually a kind of strange error in that mistake and that he had been introduced to me as a paramilitary leader, which he was, but it turned out also his stepfather was killed. Mm. And in fact, I would have removed him from the film, except that I was not shooting the lunch break where he tells the story. I was filming something else with Adi and didn't hear the story for months. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know that he was a survivor until long after they'd cast him to play the victim in those reenactments. But normally when we see fiction, I think we are accustomed to seeing these aestheticized representations of violence in which the real world referent, the thing that would be depicted, is wholly absent. But here we're seeing these movie violence in which the real horror haunts every frame mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's the real people, mm -hmm. it's in the real similar places, and the people have real connections to this violence. And the fact that such movie violence could be made, the fact that such events could be aestheticized into movie violence, is the ultimate symptom of the impunity that the film seeks to address. It is the ultimate symptom mm -hmm. of the fact that the killers have won. Otherwise, there would be no dramatizing of these events. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think unconsciously or consciously strikes very close to all of our lives. As an American, we have a whole Hollywood genre dedicated to the glorification of genocide, namely mm -hmm. the Western, which is a glorification mm -hmm. of the slaughter of the Native Americans. We would not make those scenes if the... Native American genocide had not been successful to the point that the, our society could spend hundreds mm -hmm. of years, decades and decades of glorifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the Western would not exist as a genre, and we sense that these reenactments would not exist if the killers had mm -hmm. not won. And it is that that they are a symptom of. So as Anwar is trying to run away from his pain by proposing each new reenactment, trying to run away from what's wrong, wrong with the previous reenactment, and we would only shoot one reenactment at a time. We would shoot one scene, Anwar would watch it, respond, and propose the next time, always trying to run away from the pain he felt the previous time. As he's doing that, I think I'm trying to, as I said earlier, to expose a regime of corruption mm -hmm. here in the community on behalf of the survivors. And each reenactment, each grotesque dramatization is material for that explosive. Mm -hmm. God, talking about reality, I mean, the film was broadly screened in Indonesia. Well, is there a real, is there an effect, like a political effect of this film? The best part of releasing The Act of Killing has been its effect in Indonesia. The film has transformed the way Indonesia talks about its past. It's led the Indonesian media to open up about the genocide. They've been speaking of it as a kind of glorious but vague chapter in Indonesian history, now they talk about it as a genocide. They've come up, produced in-depth reports, investigative reports on the killers and on what happened, on the killings, and on the contemporary power of the killers. Our whole strategy for releasing the film in Indonesia has been to avoid the film being banned. So we knew that if we, knew that if we simply wanted to release it commercially like a normal film, it, we'd have to submit it to the censors first. They would likely ban the film. If the film's banned, it becomes a crime to watch the film at all. If it's a crime to watch the film, that in turn becomes an excuse for the paramilitary group, Pancasila Youth, or for the uh, Indonesian army to physically attack screenings. So to avoid that, we knew we had to build up a high level of cultural, political, and media support for the movie before we started screening it. We held screenings shortly after the film's international premiere 
uh, in the, through, throughout the autumn of 2012 at the National Human Rights Commission in Jakarta for Indonesia's leading filmmakers, celebrities, news editors, news publishers, historians, artists, intellectuals, and survivors groups. Everyone who saw the film said this is the most important work ever made about our country and we need it to be seen by everybody as quickly as possible. They took the film back to their communities on International Human Rights Day 2012, that's December 10, so it took a bit over a year ago, and held simultaneous screenings by invitation only. Invitation only because we thought that was less likely to provoke a ban before the film really took root. There were 50 screenings in 30 cities on that day, averaging in size about 200 people each, so 10,000 people saw the film on the first day. As of the summer, six months later, last summer, the film that had grown to over 1,100 uh, 1, screenings in over 118, in, sorry, in, in 118 cities, the, almost all of those screenings were public. And the reason for that change was the media's response for the, to the film, Good, which is perhaps best exemplified in the response of Tempo magazine, the largest media, pub, the largest publication in Indonesia. It's a Indonesia's leading news magazine. The editor of the magazine called me after seeing the film at the Human Rights Commission in Jakarta and said, Josh, there was a time before the act of killing, now there will be a time after the act of killing in Indonesia. I've been censoring stories about the genocide since I've been in this job, and I'm not going to do it anymore, he said, because I don't want to grow old as a perpetrator. I, it is time for us to break our silence on the genocide, and to do that, he sent 60 journalists around the country to effectively replicate what I did in those first two years before I met Anwar, looking for perpetrators who would boast. In two weeks, they collected a, a, nearly a 1,000 pages of boastful testimony. They published 75 pages, plus 25 pages about the movie, and a special double, double thickness edition of Tempo came out on the 1st of October, 2012, it sold out immediately, they reprinted it, it sold out again, they reprinted it, it sold out again. Because Indonesians were astonished that this Holocaust that has underpinned the whole regime that the media never talks about was suddenly filling a double edition of the most important publication in the country. The rest of the media, of course, followed suit, published their own reports investigating the genocide and, con and its connections to contemporary impunity and corruption and fear. The film has opened this space for Indonesians to finally talk about their most painful political issue problems for the first time without fear, and has therefore in that sense really come as the survivors of the human rights community hoped it would, like the child in the emperor's new clothes, pointing to a reality that everybody knew was there but had been too afraid to address. Once it's, that space is opened, grassroots movements would finally address and overcome those problems can start to be built or can be re-energized. Thank you very much for telling us more about the act of killing and more about the context and also the effect of it.